opportunity to host uh, a conversation with three leading people who are, are, are my kind of dream um, activists who are connected to things that I'm really passionate about and I know everyone else in the room is as well. So we've got um, Fergus Garrett and Nigel Dunnett. Fergus, um, most of you will know, is the head gardener at Great Dixter, who um, is also one of the world's leading teachers of uh, horticulture and gardening and creative ecology, who will be um, leading part of the conversation this evening. And Nigel Dunnett, who'll be speaking with him, is the uh, professor of landscape architecture at the University of Sheffield and is one of the team that was involved in uh, the Gray to Green. And you can see hopefully on your screen uh, a little shot of that. And also involved in the team behind the um, planting of the Olympic Park in London. And our third speaker tonight is Paul Hannum. And Paul is an author. His books are here, The Wisdom of Groundhog Day and Significance, and is also um, uh, involved in something that's very near and dear to my heart, which is positive psychology. He's um, an eco-psychologist, and he'll be talking to us a little bit about um, the psychology of behavior change. He, um, we're here for um, a number of different reasons, and I thought, as um, well welcoming our guest stars this evening, um, and we're really to have you guys speaking tonight. I also thought it'd be useful to give some of you a little bit of background to why we're here. Um, there are some new faces this evening, and we started this um, series of conversations as um, part of a um, the Hastings community uh, emergency response um, that was happening as a result of COVID-19. And there were a group of people who were meeting on this day to talk about what needed to happen immediately to enable the town to deal with all of the crises that were happening as a result of um, the pandemic. So we started uh, uh, early morning every Thursday for two hours, having a uh, really intense, very, very quick response conversations about what, what needed to be done. And then into this, what started to happen was things were opening up a little bit, things were changing. We were starting to talk about life after COVID, um, which seems like a very long way now. But in the course of those conversations, what stood to happen in that group um, which was at the time about 25 organizations, local organizations and individuals who are really, really focusing on the present, was that we started to hear at a national level, at an international level and at a local level, a lot about recovery and about building back better. And what started to happen was those phrases and words were being used to plan what started to sound to some of us as if it was some familiar stuff that we really didn't want to go back to. Um, we were building back better, but in some cases where we were building back the same, or we were talking about building back the same. So those, those Thursday conversations at a community level started to become parallel conversations. And one was about what do we need to be doing now? And the other was about what do we need to be thinking about going into a future that we have no idea about? What, what might that future look like? What sorts of tools are out there? What sorts of processes? What sorts of things do we need to think about? And Jess Steele, who's always uh, the most wonderful person when it comes to fundraising and finding opportunities to make things happen, saw the National Lottery's Emerging Futures call and saw that we could apply for uh, some funding to continue these conversations in a more meaningful, structured way. So we got the money, we started the conversations. Um, some of you will have been in the process for six weeks. This is the sixth, um, in 12 weeks, sorry. Um, this is the sixth of the series. Um, we are talking about what is what comes beyond survival. We're, we're 
spending so much of our time trying to get through the day-to-day -day business of dealing with the outcomes of COVID-19, but we also need to be able to think in different ways. So this space we wanted to create was a, a, almost a pressing pause space. You know, how do we start to have a series of conversations that enable us to think more imaginatively about what if this town and this country and this world was as good as it could possibly get? What do we need to think about? What do we need to do differently? And what might we be able to bring to the table to really start to have a different way of thinking about the future? So I have said way too much, I always do. Um, I wanna hand over um, firstly to Fergus and Nigel and say welcome and thank you so much for coming. Um, the common room audience is waiting with bated breath to hear what you have to say, so thank you. Well, thank you, Sherry. Uh, well, it's uh, it's real privilege to be sharing the platform with, with Paul and, and with Nigel and to have, um, you know, one of my great heroes, Richard, in the audience as well, Richard, Richard Scott, who has been so influ influential in this, um, in this field. So I'm going to just show you a few slides uh, before handing over to, to Nigel. Um, let's see, share. Okay, so I'm sorry it's a bit grim to start with, but um, the recent government report on loss of biodiversity in the UK paints a really grim picture. You know, it shows more than 40% of the UK species in significant decline. For instance, take an example of some, a, a bird that's found in Hastings. Swifts have declined nearly 60% since 1995. And we're very fortunate in, in that we've got, you know, some of the country's leading experts just um, around us in the town and in the neighboring um, town of, of Rye. Um, cuckoos have declined 80% since 1995. Turtle doves have declined 90%, you know, just roughly from the 1970s. The woodland bird index is down. The pollinator index is down significantly. And the UK has failed to reach 17 out of the 20 UN biodiversity targets was agreed 10 years ago and I mean we're not alone in this um, if you take Germany for for example insect populations are, are said to be down 80 percent in the last 30 years you know and, and those insects are part of that sort of that web of life you see and and so it's, it's really dire and and the interesting thing about COVID is is that um, it sort of reminded us of the precious relationship between us and nature you know um, but significantly, thousands of acres are being lost to development. Thousands of acres are lost to intensive agriculture. You know, of the 658 urban species surveyed, nearly 60% have declined and nearly 40% have declined strongly. So our natural world is under threat. And if you look at it, um, and if you look at the conservation world, gardens are ignored and on, and very often um, urban habitats can be ignored as well and so um, a few years ago we started this whole process and it was instigated by my wife Amanda um, we started a process about 10 years ago of looking into the biodiversity at Dixter and eventually this sort of this ended in a biodiversity audit which was completed last year it was a one-year study of looking at all the what life within the gardens and the whole and the estate and the whole point of it was so that i have got enough information to protect the wider estate because i knew that the garden would be protected after my time had, had finished there um, but the really interesting thing that came out of this um, is that the garden itself was richer than the land around it. Now it's not as simple as that because one feeds into a into another and one helps the other as well. But the garden was extraordinarily rich, and um, and very important to remember is that diversity is the key here. And at Dexter, over t in one year surveying, we found over two thousand three hundred species just in one year. Over a hundred species of lichen, over one hundred and thirty species of bee. That's over. A that's you know, out of a total of 280 um, for 
for the UK. There were over 400 species of moths. There were many species of butterfly, including 32 species of principal importance to biodiversity in the UK. There were over 200 species of spiders and so on and so on and so on. And, you know, and these were just from a handful of visits, you know, and the more you, you, you study, the more you find. So why was Dixter rich? Well, there was a wide range of habitats there, wet, dry, sunny, shady, mosaic woodland to mosaic grassland to bare ground. It was detritus rich, had porous buildings. By that, I meant it had old buildings where there were little holes in the, in the, um, in the timbers or in the, in the brickwork or the mortars. Uh, and so things could nest in them. Um, you know, when you take new builds, well, there are bricks that you can put in place that that are, that are that allow access for insects and so on. So, you know, under sort of all the planning that with all the planning that goes on, it's very easy to incorporate these things into new buildings or add them on to existing buildings. You don't need a 15th century manor house to have this. So it's, it's very compatible with what, what we've got in towns and cities. And we had old fence posts and we used a lot of recycled material and we had porous walls like dry stone walls and so on and so on. So it was a complex and diverse mosaic that was there. That's no different from a town and city. There was a long season of pollen and nectar um, from the plants that were there and from the sort of layered planting that we do by using bulbs. So we have a long season of display. And, and, and of course, we don't garden just with natives. They were just common garden plants. Critical to this is that we didn't spray. We stopped spraying about 14 years ago you know, cut out all the chemicals so that, you know, the, the garden found its own balance. And first of all, we had a few hiccups in the first year, second year, but then it, it completely balanced itself out. And we don't even have to think about spraying or controlling pests in the way that we used to in those days when we used to use chemicals. There's enough trauma and disturbance from digging, which creates another habitat. You know, it sort of simulates what goes on in the cliffs around, around, um, around Hastings as well. And the brownfield sites in the town simulates what goes on around in the, in the cliffs around us. And there were certain types of flowers that were rich, rich in, in food for pollinators, you know, certain things like umbels and alliums. And, and once you feed something, that feeds something else and the web feeds itself. It's all interconnected. And the more there is, the more there, there will be. And basically what that survey showed is that the countryside around us was rich, but the garden was extraordinarily rich. And it said that an intensively managed garden with ecological practices can be a haven for wildlife and great dicks to prove this. And other gardens can mimic our model without jeopardizing ornamental aesthetics. You know, you don't have to have a bramble patch or a nettle patch um, to do that. You can do it with garden flowers and together we can blur the edges between horticultural and ecology whilst creating beautiful artistic spaces. And our numbers will go up as, the, as we survey more. And our lead ecologist, who is, who is St. Leonard based, Andy Phillips, said that, that Great Dixon was one of the richest and eye-opening sites he surveyed in his 30 years. And it changed the way he thinks about gardens because he thought gardens were on the whole sterile, came to Dixter, completely changed his, changed his views about us. Now he calls us a garden nature reserve and should be designated a local nature reserve or a local wildlife site. So why is this relevant to Hastings? Well, the techniques and the mosaic systems used at Great Dixter can be replicated in any garden, but also in any village, town or city. And it just what it needs is that it needs politicians, ecologists, town planners, councils, builders, landscapers, architects, landscape architects, volunteer groups, gardeners, and private individuals to have the will to work together. The will to work together is, is, is very important. Um, but we do need the science and the experts such as Richard, such as Nigel and, and the team that's involved with the project that we're on to, to, to enable us to be most effective. So if you look at these sort of aerial pictures on the top right, you've got top left, sorry, you've got Great Dixter. 
you know, the, the sort of conurbation in the center with the countryside feeding into it. That's no different from that, a village with all the countryside feeding into it. That's in a way no different except for the density and a city. And there is Hastings. Hastings is very, very fortunate in having all that green land around it, but also is fortunate in that it's got, it's got the possibility of having these extraordinary avenues that feed the countryside into that place and vice versa. And when you look at the overall picture, there are 520,000 hectares of garden in the UK. There are approximately 280,000 hectares of roadside verge in the UK. There's 1.7 million hectares of urban area in the UK and 84% of the population is urban. And this is all out of the food production zone. And this is all within our control to do something effective. So, you know, even though I, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I love Laura Gatti and, and, and the work that she does. And I'm really, really happy with all the stuff that's going on at NEP and Rewild. And we don't have to go to those extremes to make our towns and cities effective. We can just be just by simple following a few practices and being led by experts and, and planning properly, we can still be effective like that. We can do it with gardens, we can do it managing our roadside verges, you know, and making sure that the planting is, is an effective food source and that, that there is also a habitat for these, for these things to, to live in. And, and of course, you know, there's nothing new about this. Jennifer is, Owen did a study many years ago and showed, you know, in her Leicester garden, how rich a small garden could, um, could be in biodiversity. She, her garden was only 750 meters square and she recorded over 2,600 species within that garden. And, and I love what she said, you know, this is a quote from her. She said, gardens are extraordinarily rich habitat. A lot of things are bad, but you have to realize when, where things are good and where there is hope and you have to capitalize on that. And, you know, and now is that the time is right to capitalize on this. And study, this is Nigel who will be um, following me and, and studies at Sheffield University have shown that the city's gardens, parks and allotments can support a richer biodiversity than the land around it. So biodiversity can exist in our towns and, and cities. And the great thing is that we've got these extraordinary people around us, whether it's Nigel or Richard or whether it's Julia, whether it's Shelley or, or Nicole on our, on our team, or John Little on the, on the bottom, bottom right there. There are some extraordinary people that are willing to sort of put their efforts into a place like, um, place like, like Hastings. And you may um, sit there and think, well, actually, it's also very well him talking about Dexter because they've got that marvelous 15th century manor house, those extraordinary borders, you know, et cetera, so on. Well, look, you've got the building there, you've got the borders there, which are gardens, you've got the pathway, which could be a road or a pavement, you've got the mown grass, you've got the long grass and the woodland. That's no different from an urban situation like this. You know, it's just by tweaking this, we can still get the same sort of effects. At Dexter, we have, you know, walls like this that are rich in red valerian and Mexican daisies and aquilege and those sort of things. That's no different from the walls that we can mm. sort of manipulate and have around, around Hastings. You see how the two are sort of, there are similarities between the two at all. And both, both of those areas, those sites can feed a, a sort of a map like this is just creating this sort of complex habitats that feed this complex web that's there. It's about diversity. And what pains me is seeing a scene like this at the Bourne car park and the following year, seeing it sprayed off like this. There's absolutely oh. no need for, for, for that, for that oh. to happen. And then it happened the year after as well. And this is about working together and bringing wildlife in at every opportunity from buildings to our parks across the whole range. This isn't a pie in the sky idea. It can be done you know, with sort of concerted effort from all of us. It can be done from mosaic habitats to swift bricks, to swift bricks and buildings, to creating new meadows, to adding trees to increase oxygen, to give shade, to swallow up CO2, to absorb pollutants. It's all within our reach. And everyone will do, bring a different element, which will add up to something extraordinary. 
And I come from this scene. This is great Dexter, but you don't need to have that in Hastings in order to create the same sort of thing. But people in their own gardens can do that. But you can certainly have scenes like this where you have a porous wall that with a sort of self-sown element of vegetation that's in there that, that actually um, makes people feel better, but it's a haven for wildlife as, as well. So my point about this is that it may seem that it is out of reach this, to achieve this, but I think with, with joint up effort throughout the town and city with expert guidance, we can do this and set an example to other places. And so with that, I wanna pass on to, to, to Nigel. Nigel, are you there? Yeah, of course, I was just doing the usual thing of speaking away with my microphone off. Yeah. Anyway, I'm here now. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. It's really nice to be with you all tonight. And um, it's really nice to uh, speak after Fergus, because I think really a lot of what I've been doing in my own work has been trying to capture that same sort of sense of diversity and bounty and joyousness and sheer beauty that um, is a great dixter but looking to ways that we can take that um, but make it work in public places and in particular make it work maybe maybe make it work in really urban places um, not just to fit with the surroundings but also so that we can maintain it under kind of the sort of restraints that, that we might find in the public landscape i'm actually a researcher half the time at the university of Sheffield into sustainable uh, planting sustainable urban landscapes and the other half of the time I'm really a designer practitioner collaborating with many many different bodies and groups to to really put that research into action. Uh, next slide please Fergus. So one of the places I've worked um, is at the Barbican uh, which is still ongoing and there's a whole new phase of work coming on stream uh, next year and you know for those of you who know the Barbican in London it is just about the most urban, kind of brutal place you can imagine. I suppose the point I'd like to make with this slide here is that um, a naturalistic, ecologically focused approach that's in tune with nature actually works really well in very urban settings. And of course, you could argue that in very urban settings is where we really need it the most. And, it, and it's unfortunate, really, that we hardly ever see it. Um, this is really a meadow, it's a designed meadow, it's a design, designed plant community. But of course, it's a little bit different to a, a wildflower meadow you'd find in the countryside. It's, it's amplified or it's enhanced, it's, sort of, it's a sort of enhanced nature. And it seems to me, it, it's, it's a bit strange to say, you know, can we enhance nature? But I think we can, I think we can go one step beyond. Uh, we can almost improve on nature in, in, in many ways for our towns and cities. And for me, it's about exaggerating the visual, creating a real sense of drama um, and perhaps doing things which you would never really find uh, growing in the wild. Next slide, please, Fergus. I think one of the uh, exciting things about oh. bringing this sort of dynamic and enhanced nature into towns and cities is that the contrast with the buildings, with the built environment really heightens the naturalness of of that natural experience but also the naturalness of the of the vegetation of the landscape really complements or enhances uh bold contemporary architecture so there is a tendency i think to to look backwards and to kind of be very rustic and and rural with with um ecologically inspired landscapes but i think they can be really really modern really contemporary really forward looking and speak to the future this is a November photo from the Barbican, and I think it's really important that um, things look as good in the winter as they do in the middle of the summer. Next slide, please, Fergus. Um, and this is an example um, that some of you might have seen, Valley Gardens in Brighton that was planted up uh, a year ago, just about. And these are photos that I didn't take, but was, that were sent to me for, um, in September, early October. Next slide, please. And this is very natural again, but you can see the um, backdrop of the streets and the buildings and the pavements. And I think, again, it really does reinforce 
the desirability of bringing this feel into the heart of the town. Next slide, please, Fergus. I think, um, you know, one thing to point out here is that this is an early October photo. And um, just like Fergus said, with, with Dixter and with the gardens and the, the huge benefits for biodiversity that the complexity of structure brings, well, it's the same here. This has all the structure of, of, um, of natural plant communities, but it's full of flower right at the end of the summer and into autumn. And again, this is something we can do. We can extend the flower and we, we can provide pollinator resource right the way almost to this time of the year. Uh, we, we can, again, go one step beyond uh, the, the nature we might find outside the town or the city. Next slide, please. And of course, um, we, we need to really rethink um, what horticulture and what gardens do and what landscapes do. It's, it's no longer enough to, to really think these are just ornamental or these are decorative. In fact, that might be the, the kind of lower down the, um, the list of priorities now, because um, as we all know, using the combination of plants and soils, particularly in ecological communities, we can do incredible things. We can cool down overheated places. We can dry out flooded places. We can rehydrate parched places and we can clean up polluted places. And we can do it in a way that is beautiful and which people respond to. This is a, an image, it's not a great digster. It's not of a National Trust garden or Royal Horticultural Society garden. It's in the inner city on a street in Sheffield. And um, this is the Greater Green Scheme, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the quality of the planting and the diversity of the planting here is as good as you would find in the most famous gardens. And yet it's in a public place maintained by the normal sort of public authorities that do this, we, we can do this. It's just needs a different way of looking at things. But I think the main point that I'd like to make is that it's no longer enough just to play around at the edges of this to, to maybe make a little meadow here or to, to make a new community garden there, put a green roof on a building, make a rain garden somewhere else. They'll have small scale localized effects, but of course the, the pressing urgency of the climate and biodiversity emergencies and the health and well-being emergencies mean that we have to do this on a big scale now and we have to do it now we have to plan for it now and when we start to do this it means it is transformational it's transformational in the way places look it's transformational in the way places use them i think it's actually transformational in who uses them and it's transformational in the way we look after them so it's a hugely challenging thing. And, you know, we do have to wake up to the fact that we do have to transform pretty much everything um, to achieve the sort of outcomes that we're all gonna, gonna need. Next slide, please. Um, and, and we can bring it right into the middle of the most urban places. Actually, this is one of my seed mixes, but I came across it by accident a month ago um, next to St Pancras Station in London. And this is a bioswale, uh, which will take the surface water runoff from um, the road and the pavement. Uh, they did it quite late. It was too late to plant it up with the intended plantings. They seeded this, this mix of flowers in there. And this is again in October. And what an amazing thing to have it in the heart of the city. We don't have to have formal landscapes. We don't have to have hard landscapes. We don't have to have dead landscapes. Next slide, please. Wow. <laughs> so this next slide that's coming up um, is, um, again, I have to say, as, as Fergus is saying, that, that Richard, uh, Richard Scott, in, who's, who's on this, this call, has been a huge influence to me and many other people in the work in Liverpool with Land Life, and now the National Wildflower Centre and Eden Project. Um, this is very much inspired by that. This is a, a project called the River of Flowers, um, which ran for eight kilometers on the ring road around Rotherham next to Sheffield, uh, where the central reservation and some of the highway edges were converted from mown grass into these flowering flower fields. Not only did it, it actually caused national and international headlines, um, but it saved money. It paid for itself over and over again. Um, because of the change in management, the, the, the lack of need to close off the road, 
uh, whenever the grass was cut and so on. These can not only achieve environmental objectives, they can achieve economic benefits too. Next slide, please. So I think um, for me, um, the more and more I've done this, I think the, the mission really is for all of us in whatever way we can, uh, whether it's very small scale or whether it's very big scale, is to kind of infiltrate transformational nature for all the benefits it brings uh, and to look for every opportunity that there is to do it. Next slide, please. Because we know it's good for people. We know it's got all the benefits that, uh, of health and, and well-being benefits. We know it makes environment, environmental sense. But, but there's more and more evidence that it makes economic sense too, not just in the big picture in terms of cooling and flood prevention and so on. We can have real direct economic benefits by having nature-rich high streets. Uh, the research is showing that people, there's greater footfall where there's more nature on a high street. People spend more. People travel further to get there and people stay there longer. This is a, a greening scheme on a street in London, a, a kind of retail street, St. Bride Street in London, where it's almost like going into a woodland uh, with all the layers of vegetation as you walk along that street. Next slide, please. So I just finish off um, by showing a few pictures of the Greater Green Scheme in Sheffield. Um, I guess it, 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 des it describes what it does. It's maybe not the most imaginative uh, name, but this is a, a scheme, actually it's um, really quite a long-term scheme, which is done, being done in phases. The latest phase has just been finished. It's about one and a half kilometers in total length. And it runs along um, in, a, in a city dual carriageway, which was the main ring road around Sheffield City, city, Sheffield city Center until about 10 years ago when, when an outer ring road was built. And then this became much less trafficked. Um, and the city council in Sheffield had a really visionary idea to really um, reduce traffic on this to two lanes, mostly cars, mostly taxis, buses and access, and then to give the rest of it back to people in terms of gardens. And I really do think, you know, when we think about the future and where we can make new gardens in cities and towns, it's not necessarily in making big new parks, it's not necessarily new gardens. The streets can become the new gardens and the streets really can be turned back to people and this dominance, this free ride for the car um, to, to kind of dominate what's done, that's gonna change. And so we have opportunities to maybe follow this lead. So probably 60% of what you can see there now has now been turned over into really high quality, accessible, green. Next slide, please. We worked with Sheffield City Council um, to develop visions with, with my students and, and kind of ideas for this and um, to really raise funds for the project. And this is one of my student schemes, which is pretty much exactly what's been done. So um, you can see here that it has a flood uh, surface water management um, objective, but the main objective was uh, to create a fantastic landscape scheme that would attract new economic activity into this area. Uh, so this is the visual. Next slide, please. This is the reality with the bus there again. Um, so the highway is separated out from pedestrians and cycleway. And of course, there's a health benefit from doing that with this green buffer to really protect people from emissions from the, the vehicles. I took this photo almost after sunrise. So there's nobody around. Next slide, please. The same here, this is a dawn shot in, um, in June, I think. Um, just look at the diversity, look at the, the kind of quality of that planting there, but this is, this is in the inner city. Next slide, please. And here it is full of life, people using it. It's amazing to me how this just becomes part of the background. You know, although I think it's extraordinary, I think most people walking up and down, you know, just, just accept it as, as, a, as a wonderful place. We've, found out that about 15% of people using this have changed their daily route so they can come up and down this, this road to school or to work or whatever. Next slide, please. Um, I took these photos in February of this year just to give some winter shots. People always ask, it's fine to show pictures in the summer, what does it look like in the winter? 
we'll leave all the seed heads, everything standing up. It's cut down at the end of February and then weed it over and then it just really pretty much looks after itself after that. Next slide, please. So yeah, that's the February view, as, as beautiful with the browns and the textures and the seed heads as it really is in full flower in the summer. Next slide, please. And then um, just to finish off, this is phase two. These are photos from October this year, still in construction. Um, the whole scheme is the UK's largest retrofit uh, urban water management scheme, rainwater management scheme. It's also the UK's largest green street or longest green street. And there's still more phases to come. Here in this image, there's road traffic, there's pedestrian and cycleway. So it, it's really separating out all these different uses. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I think you just run through these images here really, but just to reinforce that these are October photos and it's still in full flower. And this is the trick really to, to have these looking beautiful almost every single day of the year when they're in really visible public places. Next slide, please. Um, and I guess bringing it back to Hastings and some of the discussions that we've been having, uh, that sign there, which is too small to read, um, that's showing the way to the station. And this is a pedestrian route and a cycle route from Sheffield Station that takes you through all of this into the city. Next slide, please. I think this might be the last one. Um, again, I, I just have to emphasize, <laughs> this is the dual carriageway, uh, really traffic road full of people. Um, and yet we can achieve this beauty. And as Fergus said, um, the biodiversity benefits of this are or will be absolutely amazing too. I think that's it. Thank you. Well done, Nigel. Oh my goodness. Can we have a round of applause? Well, well done. Well done, Richard and Polly. Wow. <laughs> wow. That that was um, really inspiring. Inspiring. Stunning amazing, breathtaking, and... Uh, well, I should have said, I forgot to say, with the Greater Green Scheme, um, we've got the costings from the City Council. It's actually cheaper to maintain all of that high quality landscape, all the pavements, all the roads, than it was previously when it was just road and pavement and the conventional drainage system. So uh, really significant cost benefits uh, flowing on from that investment. Hi Nigel, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Right, sorry, it's Nick Harper. I, I met you at uh, Dulwich College with Rachel Reynolds about a year or so ago, I don't know if you remember, but um, it's really interesting what you just said about um, it costing less to maintain planting. I'm, I'm meeting local authorities all the time and trying to suggest this kind of thing and they, they don't, they're not interested in taking on new planting. They don't have the budgets for it, they don't have the teams for it. Um, it would be great to have, you know, the stuff that you're talking about at our fingertips so we can say, actually, you know, if you stop having ornamental beds and you have perennial planting, the cost difference is this, it will save you money. Um, I mean, that's probably my ignorance. So where, where, where could I go for, where could we go for information like that? Uh, I think it's, it's all over the place. I mean, we will be publishing this next year, but, but I, you know, I've, I find the same thing. It's always, oh no, we can't do that. But particularly when you start to look at anything with any complexity or diversity to it, oh no, no, we can't afford that. Too expensive to maintain, too difficult to maintain. And that's not necessarily the case because it's not more expensive to maintain. It's just different to maintain. It yeah. is a different set of skills. It doesn't necessarily need a lot more money. It doesn't necessarily need a lot more people. It's just a different way of doing it. And one of the things we've done in Sheffield, because we've been doing this for a long time, and because we have the university involved, I guess, is that we've really built up enterprises of, of landscape contractors who now know what to do and, um, and are skilled in that. And actually, they've, they've been brought in to maintain a greater green for the first three years, the establishment phase. 
So it's almost like, you know, chicken and egg. You, 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 you start something and then it develops and develops. And now we have, you know, a landscape economy based around this sort of technique. And, and we can not only do it more in Sheffield, but then it can be done elsewhere as well. So, um, you know, it, it's almost a case it just has to be done to, to kind of kick things off. It sounds like you need to light, you know, light the fire and then get some momentum going. And you need people at every level from the landscape architects through the contractors through to the maintenance teams. And once everyone buys into it, you start to, to grow something. But I think I just feel in Hastings, we're um, still in the 1970s, probably when it comes to this kind of thinking at, at local authority level. I mean, no insult to anyone on the, in the team. <laughs> No, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut in just just because I'm acutely aware of the time. But thank you for that. And there are people in the room from the local authority and from the county council. And I, I think this is, you know, this is part of a very rich conversation that we can continue after we hear from Paul, who's been waiting very patiently. Um, and uh, I have to, you know, just uh, mention that, you know, what what we've just seen is inspirational and transformational and you know Nigel said it beautifully when he talked about you know this is about economic benefits it's about benefits for people it's about planet it's about health it's about biodiversity but there is a reality here you know this is about human beings doing things differently and there are lots of reasons why things like this are not happening and I think Paul you are an expert in this area and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say about how do we do this how do we start to make this kind of thing happen on a more regular basis on a more sustainable basis so welcome and uh, yes the floor is yours well, thank you very much, and thank you for two wonderful uh, presentations there. I'm afraid my visuals are nowhere near as exciting, but I'll try and keep it as engaging as possible. But the fact is what Fergus and Nigel were describing is one of many uh, very compelling efforts at changing, you know, changing landscape, changing behaviour, changing conservation with renewable energy. In so many areas, we are facing what I believe is going to be the greatest transformation in history and the biggest effort at changing history. Because if we're going to achieve the goal of keeping below the one and a half um, degree increase in temperature by 2030, which I think we all know about, we have to based on IPCC uh, science, then we have to change everything about our lifestyle, about our communities and our society, if we're gonna decarbonize our civilization. So fundamentally, we need to change our behavior, how we eat, how we use energy, how we use travel, how we work, and many other things. And behavioral change is essential to all environmental campaigns and objectives. Um, it's essential for a greener, more resilient future for Hastings. So I want to introduce five lessons I've learned about behavioral change over the last 30, 35 years since I've been working in this field. So um, just a little bit more about myself. It's, uh, I've worked as a psychologist, um, coach and consultant on many change programs very small ones. Currently, I'm co-chair of Greening Spending, which we want to be the, the greenest village in England. It's a village in Sussex. And in January, I'm doing a series of talks with the United Nations. So many different scales, working in business, universities, um, uh, governments, local councils. But there are certain universal principles of change, which I've seen um, work and more often not fail over the last 20 years. And these are sort of lessons above all from my own personal experience as well as the research. So I want to go through these. And the first one is having a very positive vision. Now, one of the challenges we all face um, in the environment is we're dealing with a torrent of bad news. I mean, just this year, we've seen these appalling forest fires in Australia and California. We've seen um, the worst temperatures, the highest temperatures in the Arctic Circle. Thank God Trump has finally gone now, as that really would have been a downer on tonight's talk. But there's been so much bad news about the state of the planet. But it's very difficult sometimes to feel how can we be positive? But the fact is that one of the biggest reasons why our green initiatives fail is because they're too negative and they're too much based on the science. And they tend to basically frighten people 
or overwhelm people or put people into into a panic and if we um overwhelm them with facts and overwhelm particularly with the, the the appalling facts about the increase in temperature and destruction of wildlife they will go into denial avoidance or even reject the evidence a minority of people are motivated by dire warnings but the majority of people aren't and as neuroscientists have really demonstrated guilt fear and anxiety causes us to withdraw to freeze to give up rather than taking action it's just overwhelming so we need to have a positive vision for everything we do one of the great things about the previous presentations was it's a clear very strong positive visual image of how great landscape can look when we do this whether it be a great dexter the barbican or sheffield the problem is how do we get that across for more abstract ideas like dealing with with climate what i call climate breakdown or with you know just the need to move to renewable energy or reduce water. But the fact is we have to have, in my view, a positive vision of how life could be better. So in the work I'm doing um, in standing and in other areas, we focus on creating a shared vision of the good life. And the good thing about um, contending with, with climate breakdown, ecological collapse, is that we can actually improve our life. It's not just about wearing a hair shirt or about going with less. It's about boosting our physical health, our mental health, getting out in nature more, coming together as communities, sharing our values and working together. And we, I believe, can show a very compelling vision about how life can be better for every stakeholder. And it's important we sit down with our friends and with our families and we have a dialogue with them and talk about how life could be better. Now I know one of the things that Sherry talks about and I think you've been using at Hastings is the idea of the wheel of well-being and we need to show how pro-environmental behaviour is good for our body, our mind, our spirit, people, place and of course planet. So that's very important that we move towards a better life rather than just moving away from the calamitous facts that we're dealing with. Mm. The second um, lesson I've learned is you have to design a change program to succeed. Often we go in with very good intentions and we think just because we, we're passionate and excited, everybody's going to fall into place. But of course, that doesn't happen. And a lot of campaigns fail because they're poorly designed and they're based on incorrect assumptions. Now, one of the big challenges in the environmental movement, and I've been involved in it for over 20 years, both professionally and personally, is that it's still very much restricted to mainly white, mainly middle class, mainly graduate people. And it haven't, we still, in large parts of England, it's the same in the States, haven't broadened and become more inclusive. So it's vital that we have a very strong way of having dialogue and communicating with as many demographics as possible. And we really connect to the mainstream and to people's everyday lives so we don't come across as a clique. And sometimes that can happen. It's also vital, and we're doing this very strongly at a local level now, is we work with all the key stakeholders, not just the environmental or conservation groups, but the council, business, schools, churches, societies, clubs, sports clubs, literally every possible stakeholder. Because if you can get them involved, then you're more likely to succeed rather than fighting them, bring them in and find common ground. It's important to have clear, measurable outcomes, to have a very engaging mission and brand. You know, don't get caught up in jargon. So make Hastings, for example, the greenest town in Britain is more exciting than make Hastings carbon neutral. So a lot of the language and jargon doesn't excite and inspire people in the environment. But the big area in terms of designing a program is, is making sure that our interventions and our messaging really encourages behavior by using something that in the, in the world of psychology is called choice architecture, but it's better known as nudges. You might all have heard of this idea of nudging, encouraging people to make behavioral change. And if you do this properly, it greatly increases the probability of success because people 
tend that they respond to some extent to incentives, information and persuasion, but it's more important often how they are framed and communicated. So for example, people need to make, we need to make sure that environmental information is made very accessible. This is by, by a priming. So it's having notices, information, making sure people can see it, but also using something called salience, which is repeating it. People, very rarely change from just one or two reminders. It needs to be consistent. It's very important. Think of yourself when you've tried to change a habit. You, we change through practice and through repetition. Now, some interesting examples of how this works, nudging. Studies on meat consumption measured uh, vegetarian meal purchases and self-reported changes in eating meat. Just by changing the menu to vegetarian only and moving meat-based options onto a separate menu actually increased the proportion of vegetarian meals by 50%. So just changing a position and moving things around can have a huge difference. Um, similar with water uses, there's a lot of um, famous examples where they, hotels have tried to reduce water or do less um, washing of bedding. Um, have they tried different interventions. The one that worked best was putting a notice in that said, most of the guests at our hotel prefer not to wash the bedding every day because they want to save water. And just having that social norm and feeling that you are sharing with other people is very powerful. So again, changing the wording is very, it really can work well. Another vital area which we often forget about in environmental programs is feedback. One of the reasons smart meters are so prevalent now is it's, it's an instant feedback loop that you can get. And for any community initiative, whether it be increasing recycling, reducing water usage, or the adoption of any behavior, having feedback, and even more powerful than feedback back to you, is comparative feedback. So measuring different families to see how much they're saving, different streets, different neighborhoods. Then you make it more of a game, which again increases the adoption of behavior. Other ways to do this include use messengers who are credible and likable to the particular demographic that you're working with. People like us. We tend to model people like us rather than so-called experts being parachuted in. <laughs> and um, so find people locally, getting people to make pledges and commitments, especially publicly, making it convenient. So organic vegetable delivery works very well, coming straight to the door rather than having to go out to a store or lots of different stores to find the produce. The third area is the whole area of influence. Now, this is a real biggie for me. What we now know from probably thousands of studies is that information alone is not enough. Relying on people's rationality, relying on them to see the evidence and just change their behavior like that rarely works. Uh, sometimes it does, but more often it, not it doesn't. So just telling people to save water because we've got water shortage will rarely be enough to change behavior over the long term. There are two broad types of influence which have been studied now over 50 years. And the first one is what we call informational influence, which is what I've described, giving people the evidence of facts. But there's a more powerful one, which is what we call normative influence. And that's getting people to conform to fulfill their needs and what other people expect from them. So it's appealing to people's values and especially the values of their neighbors and their group. We all want to feel we belong. And if all our neighbors in the road are doing something, we're far more likely to do it. And if we hear other people doing it, people like us, we're more likely to do it too. So in any change program, you need information and what we call normative influence. You need both. You need to appeal to both hearts and minds. And these are useful when you're looking at any sort of correspondence or, or um, messaging, whether it be social media, email, or, or face, um, face to face, to have it almost as a checklist to make sure you're not just using your preferred communication style. Now, the language we use is incredibly important. We want simple, memorable, and compelling terms. For example, we now... Um, the people I work with, we don't talk about climate change, we talk about climate breakdown. We started, instead of saying save the planet, 
we said save the family. And there's an interesting study that says when we talk about saving our family or our children or grandchildren, that has far more impact than talking about an abstract concept such as saving the planet, which has been the more traditional approach. All of the messaging needs to be relevant. It needs to be more concrete and less abstract. People, we, we, all, we all struggle sometimes to deal with big abstract ideas that seem a long way away in terms of time into the future or in terms of distance. We're, we're hardwired in evolutionary terms to deal with more immediate threats and more immediate needs. So we need to try and be more concrete and specific in our language. Uh, to be meaningful as well and engaging and, and when we talk to use visuals the last two presentations use terrific visuals it really adds to that using stories and real life examples again a lot of the environmental communication is poor yet you watch one david attenborough documentary and people get it because it uses engaging stories great visuals a master presenter the content could be exactly the same with a scientist talking, um, a more academic scientist say, and it wouldn't have the same impact. And connect your message to people's everyday concerns, their family, health, mental health, work, quality of life. Now, one of the things I've learned most um, in terms of the change programs I've been involved in, whether it be individual, organizational, or, or much larger groups, is that we, and I think this is probably the biggest mistake most change programs make, is all the focus goes in the launch of a change program, but not in the maintenance of it, in the long-term uh, reinforcement and development of it. Most change or many change initiatives fail due to lack of follow-up and follow-through. If we think of an example um, from most of our lives, we, let's say uh, over Christmas, we put on a bit of weight and we recognize that we need to change, we need to lose weight. We have a very clear intention to lose weight. We then um, gain the knowledge to change. We research local gyms. We then initiate the change. We join and we get a discount and we go down, we get all the clothing, we go down, we get stuck in. And three months later, how many people do you think who join gyms in January are still there? Not very many. And it applies to all areas of change. And remember, with the environment, we're not just talking about one habit with a very clear benefit, like going to the gym. We're talking about complex habits, which we've been doing our whole life in terms of our behavior. So knowledge is not enough. Intention is not enough. And we need to support people through long-term change, which means when we design change programs, we need to put probably most of our effort into what happens after its launch and have regular follow-up. Practice, reinforcement is the key, and designing change is an ongoing process. The final lesson I've learned, um, which is for me at the heart of what leads to really long-term change, and this is the work I'm, I'm doing with the United Nations and what I write about a lot, is the idea that we need a new story. In Effectively, in terms of what we're talking about, we need a new story that we are not consumers of the earth, we are citizens of the earth. We need to fundamentally change our identity and our self-image of who we are and what our role is. You know, the world needs us now. We all know this. I, I don't need to go through all the facts. We're in a desperate situation and we cannot carry on the way we've been. And I think one of the reasons we've got into this mess, and I, I go into great detail on, on other webinars about this, is we've been almost conned into thinking that the goal of our life is to be consumers. Maybe not the people here but most people in this country you know we still measure gdp we that is a, the main measurement people are educated and brought up to to have high paying jobs to go and consume more our, our version of the good life is all a very high aspirational very high carbon lifestyle and we have to fundamentally change that or we're always going to be swimming against the tide we need a new story about who we are as individuals, as citizens of our communities and stewards of our, our precious earth. And behavioral change is ultimately an inside out job. It's about changing from within. Yes, we act in our own interests, but even more importantly, we act in accordance with our own values, our own self image. We do what feels right and what feels authentic. And we live out stories that really resonates with our beliefs, our self image and identity.
And I strongly believe that long-term uh, behavioral change needs a new story that we're really telling ourselves. But we need to find new answers to these questions. Who am I? What do I stand for? What's most meaningful for me? What legacy do I want to leave? What do I want to contribute? And this is, um, my last book was all about this because I've, I've, from all my work in psychology, I've found the most powerful way to change our behavior is to change the story, uh, our very identity about who we are. And I think even working in a community is to look at the whole identity, the whole story about what is Hastings? What is the community? Where are we now? Where do we want to go to? And if we can find that very compelling story that motivates us and inspires us and, and impassions us, then I think we're capable of doing anything. So there's a few lessons. I just want to end with a quick graph, um, a very exciting graphic, which shows just some of the, the different areas to consider when you're designing a change program. I've left out rules and regulation law because that might not be within our purview, but um, we do need information. We do need high quality information, but presented with nudging and in the most powerful, compelling way. Social influences. We have to think about the incredible impact of peer pressure on our behavior and social norms and culture. Incentives, they don't have to be financial, but what's in it for the people? Each of these different stakeholders, how will their life be better? What's in it for them? Nudges, I've talked a lot about how we can just shift gently people towards it. And emotional appeals. People do respond to highly engaging people. They do respond to passion. And we need to get that across, but not in a way that overwhelms people, but in a way that really people can, um, can identify with and associate with. So on that note, I will say thank you and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Paul. That was fantastic. Um, yeah. Let's let's open the floor to questions, comments, observations, opinions, ideas. I just I just saw up. Sherry a question there. Sorry to interrupt. A really good question about people's I think it's about people's real needs. Um, something just came in there, and that's something I did main, want to mention in terms of this version of a good life. There was a brilliant uh, Chilean economist called Max Neef, who some of you might have heard of, and he came up with this phrase called pseudo-satisfiers. And he said, we have built a culture and a society on pseudo-satisfiers. A pseudo-satisfiers, things like the need for power or status or celebrity or wealth, you know, things more about ego. And what I'm talking about is creating a version of a good life based on our authentic needs, the needs that we've proven through positive psychology, which you mentioned, Sherry, make us really happy, which is a need for community, for belonging, for meaning, for relationships, for health, for being, you know, a connection to nature, for volunteering, all these things, which are largely free and are the opposite of these pseudo satisfiers, which have so dominated our modern consumer culture. Thank you. Um, go ahead, I can hear somebody's got a question. Um, I'd just be really interested to, my, my name's Polly and I've done the work in Liverpool with um, Richard for Wildflowering since 2014. Um, but my role has been with the public engagement, so working so much with the social sector. So the social sector in Liverpool is as big as the financial sector in Liverpool. And there are many, many different kinds of, not just environmental groups, um, like, like you mentioned, sports groups, like boxing clubs, like um churches schools we've worked with many of these and we've sort of developed a bit of a set of ethics or principles that we always have community at sewings we have live music local food at every sewing we um very much try and build community seed banks and kind of have partnerships at these levels and i'd just be interested to hear from the people living in Hastings around how they see these connect, how they see these small organizations perhaps, or 
cultural organizations, potentially connecting with some of these because we find that they are multipliers um, often because of the way that artists can bounce off, like bands can start thinking differently about like maybe a song that goes with it that then gets performed at local nights that there's there's kind of so many ways of communicating beyond the spaces themselves and I'd just be interested to hear while we're on this call if people from Hastings have got ideas around that element. Thank you Polly. Yeah, do jump in folks. There's an awful lot of people in this room who've got amazing experiences and thoughts around this. <laughs> Just to come back to Polly on that. So one of the things we've been doing as part of this, um, this project is uh, working with a, uh, a group called Free Ice Cream about mapping networks, um, about who are common individuals that connect people and bridge them. And they're, they're designing this kind of um, visual map. <clears throat> um, and it depends on the data that feeds into it, but not to go into that too much now. Um, that's just one of the tools that we're trying to use. And, and there are existing networks as well, obviously, in, in Hastings that do connect all of these things. Um, and I think quite a lot of that does happen. Uh, and that, I don't know what we call it, the sort of interpollination or whatever between groups and ideas. Uh, it's often similar, to, I think, probably to Liverpool on a different scale, perhaps, that the, the private sector isn't that strong here. It's more the, <clears throat> uh, the, the public sector has been a strong employer, but the voluntary sector is also quite uh, large uh, comparatively to Hastings, but lots of small little groups. I just wanted to, sorry, are we meant to put up our hand or I'm not sure, anyway, I'll jump in. I was just thinking about how, um, you know, at the moment with the sort of, well, Hastings has always been a town with huge inequalities of wealth, as we know, and um, particularly now with the sort of, you know, use of food banks so high and the amount of poverty in the town. I think my comment about the basic needs is how do you engage people in, greening the town, for example, when people are dealing with not being able to feed themselves. Um, but I think it can come together, can't it, with the whole food thing. And um, years ago, I helped set up a community garden in St. Leonard's and it was incredible if you just opened, we could only, with the volunteers we had, we only opened like one or two days a week. It was completely unfunded, it was run by volunteers. And, um, you know, the people who turned up and, the sort of diverse mix of people from, you know, people who'd settled because they'd been um, asylum seekers and they'd settled in the town and then they grew where they wanted to grow the food that they ate. And, um, you know, even some of the people who had drug and alcohol problems coming and just sitting in the garden. And we soon came to realize that it was that social gathering together and having mm -hmm. a place to go outside with no demands on you <laughs> that, people really that was the value that people got out of it and then you could connect them into the growing and the food and then we used to have events where we cook food as well so maybe the sort of key to this well it's in my mind the problem that people have so many severe basic sort of need deficits in this town is around greening and food um and how we can I think we have to involve families particularly because I think you know the way to influence people is through their kids and if you provide stuff to do that's providing entertainment for the children and it's also then educational and it brings the the parents in i think that's maybe where we need to to really connect with some of the the people in the town who wouldn't normally get involved in these these sorts of projects and programs mm. i don't know if mm. anybody else has any thoughts on that can i just say i think nicole you're absolutely right and you know i know the the sort of the richness that um somebody like polly can bring to a to a scheme like this i think it's it's um it is a the, the, we've been putting our heads together about a you know the center of town scheme but that but we all recognize that it's so much more than that it's about serving the whole whole community and in, in fact it's it's serving the parts of the community that need it more um and so i think our efforts shouldn't just stop there but but push on to actually spread throughout and 
and involve everybody and do as much good as we can in, in the in the right places you know so this this hopefully will be the start of something to to actually cover all those elements and and i think one of the successes of of a place like dexter is is, is because we have such a wide community it's not just sort of elite gardeners we have kids who are sort of really sort of whether they're homeless or, or disadvantaged in, in in other ways or have got difficulties and and we've got a 90 year olds working next to 14 year olds as well and that sort of richness of community really makes it um, an energy comes out of that mm. you know, yeah mustn't forget that um, when you when you on your slide you had that list of groups which was the professionals the politicians the voluntary groups there was a big list of of groups there and I was on a call this morning and Glas there was really fancy maps from green and schemes in Glasgow and Tampere and different places and I asked about if there had been um, training programs for that cut across public private voluntary sector social sector because for me what um Paul said and what Nigel says about the maintenance and the ongoing none of them have done that they might have done a few like um awareness raising for counselors but they haven't been kind of an open door and I think with the kind of um resource from Dixter and that aspiration it'd be wonderful to do something that can bring those different interested parties together in terms of some kind of awareness raising around it but we try and do it with joy we always have poets and musicians we try and like do the community things to really make an atmosphere a bit different from what a normal volunteering program would would bring like um in some way graham did you want to go ahead yeah. yeah, I was. I wanted to mention, uh, follow on from Nicole. I, I sort of come at, at a completely different direction, to be honest. I I happen to feel that one of the problems we run into is people who immediately start going to the most needy people, and um, you know, I don't think this is a particularly productive way of of going forward because. Uh, I've met a lot of, I've been involved in a lot of schemes where it, it, you need to try and meet the hard to reach. Well, the very reason they're hard to reach is because you can't reach them. And you start knocking your head against the wall. To my way of thinking, mm. if you were to be able to get, just I'm not saying discount, trying to involve everybody, but to actually sort of concentrate on a, on a perceived level of um, people, and then try and build it around them. I think you're you're starting off at, at the wrong end because I think you need to get more and more people that are already almost into it or gradually feeding themselves into it. And that way, it will hopefully grow and disseminate, and all the benefits will gradually reach down. I think it was mentioned in in the talk by Paul that one of the best ways of achieving something is to think, well, my neighbor's doing that. Well, the best way to get neighbors doing it is to get neighbors doing it. it and I think you're not likely to do that if you're gonna start off with people that are in the lower income brackets. Um, might be quite controversial that, but that's just my opinion. And also uh, to answer the question from our friend from Liverpool, my experience, I guess, until I would say recently with community groups, et cetera, in Hastings, they can be, um, they've had the same people involved with them for donkey's years and they can be very protective. And also they tend to fade out when those people fade out. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking that's changing now but that's my impression that a lot of people like to hold on to what they've got without necessarily thinking there's a bigger picture uh, involved. So, yeah, they're just some of my thoughts on, on the questions that have gone so far. Can, can I respond to a couple of uh, questions? Um, I think what Nicole was talking about and some of the others have mentioned around the, the people who are the most needy. 
Are you all familiar with Donut Economics? I saw it on one of the introductory um, emails. Now, Kate Rayworth developed that um, based uh, very much on UN models around sustainable development goals. And all the environmental goals are connected to social goals. I don't think we can separate um, the climate crisis from a crisis of social justice and inequality. And as somebody who's worked for many years, this, if, if you ask me what's the biggest cause of a mess we're in, it is unbridled capitalism. And I'm not very left wing, by the way. I'm not standing here as a politician at all. But if you just look at the sheer consumption levels and the sheer way capitalism is constructed, uh, it has led to a, a disaster for climate, has led to destruction of the environment, of topsoil and, and many species, but it's also led to gross inequality. Yes, it's raised the level for many people. I'm not denying people are better off, but the inequality, which is often the biggest problem we're facing, it's not absolute levels of, of income, it's, the, it's the, um, the gap between rich and poor. And the happiest countries in the world, by the way, are those countries, the biggest factor is those countries where there's the smallest gap between rich and poor. So I don't think we can separate these things out. We all might have our personal interests, some in wildlife, some in gardening, some in trees, some in renewable cars, but we have to come back to the core cause of the problem we're facing. And we need to make any change uh, across the whole of the system, if you like, and, and look at these issues. We can't run away from them. I wonder if I can just jump in on that, Paul, because I, I think also um, that that idea of relative inequality is such a such an important one. But I also think um, partly because Paul and I have studied similar stuff. But one of the one of the things that I think we really, really do not pay enough attention to is we get this story about the most uh, equal societies or the happiest societies, you know, the Scandinavian countries, Costa Rica, places like that. Um, and, and what you've got is you've got the happiest countries are the homogenous countries. They're where people are more the same than different. Um, Robert Putnam's stuff around social capital, he was put a lid on when his research into LA showed that the reason why there were so many problems in LA was because of the diverse populations. Now, I'm putting this out there because one of the biggest challenges we have, and everybody in the room has this, is that we see the world in a particular way. And as Paul has flagged up, we have those stories about how we live our lives, how we identify with the way we're surrounded, with people doing things that we don't think they should do, and we actually are not thinking enough and understanding enough about our internal worlds needing to change so that we can understand better why other people feel like they're wrong, feel like they're different. And having the conversations, whether it's, you know, with people who we class as, you know, the unheard or we class as, uh, you know, groups that don't agree with our opinions, that there are always going to be people who are different from us. And one of the things that in this town we need to be doing a lot more of is saying, where are those spaces? How do we create more of those spaces where we can come together and start to do things to create those visions that we've seen that are such beautiful visions and just start doing it. And those things will draw people in um, but I, I, I'm sorry, sorry, I've sort of gone off on a little bit of a soapbox about this, but I think Graham had a really good point as well, that, that we, we know we tend to get pre preoccupied with, you know, those in need, those things that are, you know, the most urgent. And we had, uh, I think Debbie was here. Is Debbie still here? Uh, Debbie and Kriba were on the community call this morning where, you know, for an hour and a half, we talked about the urgent emergency stuff that needs to happen. But it was so disheartening. I was in tears at the end of the call because I felt that we are not creating a vision of hopefulness and of change that is going to inspire people to get involved. And we can do that through some of the things that we've seen today. So I'm gonna just back off, but I just wanted to jump in on that. Uh, it's about difference. It's about understanding that we're, you know, we, we need to understand each other's difference more than what you know, what we, uh, we think we do. Sorry, yeah, Fergus. Deb, oh, sorry, Debbie was next. Can we have Debbie come in? <laughs> Hello, 
For those that don't know me, I'm from the Hastings Food Network and I'm commissioned by Public Health at the moment to look at food insecurity in Hastings and also to try and join up some of the dots around things that are happening to some food mapping in Hastings to try and avoid duplication and also to develop the food network a bit further. And I was thinking about this meeting earlier and sort of what I wanted to say. And I think one of the biggest issues we've got at the moment, food has become a huge issue. It's so relevant at the moment. But what we really need to do, we need to dig deeper. We need to really not be afraid to look at the core issues that are bringing us to the point now. I think we're very, very good in Hastings. There's a fantastic amount of food things happening in Hastings. But it seems to me that we're only touching the very rim of the problem. And I think now is the time to really look deeper into why we're in the situation we're in and what we can do to try and tackle some of that dependency rather than opening more and more food hubs and food pantries and almost enabling people. Thanks, Debbie. Can I, I, and I just like to, am I on mute? No, I'm not. Um, just reinforce the fact that having worked as a landscape architect in lots of places that um, that the thing about putting food growing at the heart of somewhere next to where kids play and and transforming some of those um, in East London, we used to call them dog shit deserts, um, where you've just got these spaces with railings around that are just a bit of mown grass. And just by having those spaces where people can come together, especially in East London, it brought together the original East London working class communities, the Bangladeshi communities, who do all, all those women who'd been sort of who'd come over and got married over here, were actually coming coming out to grow their food that they they could finally grow in a space and having those conversations again over food. But it's actually about starting to do it, and also having having some really well designed spaces to do it, so they're not always um, made on you know out of a bag packet and an envelope you know back of an envelope sort of stuff so they're nicely thought out and you've got access to water and all those practical things that you need to grow stuff um and i think they become amazing hubs they don't have to be very big um and uh yeah just wanted to say that i think just doing that stuff can start conversations can start happening in in ways you know uh that we don't know where they'll go and yeah. the same thing with sowing sowing some wildflowers and and having Make, bringing some joy so that somewhere that people can stop and go wow that's fantastic and stop and talk about that as opposed to how awful life is uh, julia there was a request in the chat there uh, if you wouldn't mind telling us about um where the What's that? sorry <laughs> just looking for it jess do you want to come in oh the hastings garden town proposal it is oh thank you oh um well, because it's <laughs> it's it's not official yet, but um, well, it is official because we're going to do it whether we get money or not. But um, it isn't anywhere yet. It's just a piece of um, it's a it's a document. Um, I can share a visual of it, but oh uh, yeah, actually, no, even that's not. It, I can tell you briefly. It it it, it came about through uh, I think Fergus wanting to do wanting to put a bid into the town deal. Um, and then Maya managed to rake in Nicole, me and Sherry and Fergus brought in Nigel and we managed to put together something um, in about a week that was about turning Hastings into a garden town and uh, the start was the start of the vision for the town deal if we get that money is about um, the station to sea route and transforming that into something that looks a bit like some of those lovely images we saw from Sheffield so that mm. the route becomes and then it links up with a green network right across the town and a series of gardens um jewel box gardens that could be dotted right through the town and connected by um green uh walking and cycling routes and also encouraging people to um turn you know in, inspired by Fergus's work at Great Dicks to turning their own gardens well there already are probably biodiverse havens and making those those connections um and planting more trees and having community gardens and all of that isn't it um yeah yeah or just you know um i started mapping um i'm not sure i got a share screen thing i just started mapping the amount of space that is taken up by buildings and by green space and i'll, I'll go oh there we are 
that's it it's a bit small um but that orange is buildings and the and this is just the town center and the green is people's gardens you can see how much space but where we really need to change it is that bit in the middle um that orange that orange blob is our town center and there's one little tiny patch of green in it and that's what we need to we need to bring all that green space that's out there right down into the heart and down to the seafront Leah, we had um, uh, a, a question, um, and I'm just wondering whether this this might be, we're, we're coming close to closing time, but I, I wonder if I might just throw it out there. Um, because I'm, I'm aware also that there are people in the room who have um, responsibilities uh, in, in different areas um, at a local authority level. Um, and we're, you know, we're being very careful about what we say and we are, you know, here in a common room space. And I think I, I would like to pose the question before we close for a few more minutes to, to just ask, you know, what do, what do people think are the most important things that we need to consider um, when we imagine this greener, more resilient Hastings for 2030? Um, and just open the floor, because I think that thing about the considerations that need to come into this conversation uh, need to be made explicit. I might even throw it open to start with Jess Steele, please. That's a bit unfair, Sherry. Um, I literally don't know. I'm so inspired. It's been really exciting. I'm really excited about the idea of our tiny little alley tucked behind Claremont, an industrial spot. And when Fergus was talking about the kind of, you know, the trauma and the disturbance that creates habitats, that's what we've got. We've got, you know, hundreds of years of slow trauma to the cliff that has created amazing habitats. And we want to make sure that that, um, that that gets even better in the future. And Jay's here, which is brilliant, because he'll be able to show you <laughs> the alley when you come and visit and help us work out how to make it really much more biodiverse space. That, that would be wonderful. And, and I suppose that's an example. Like we have control over this tiny little space. We don't even have control, we have influence. Other people have influence over other spaces. And let's try and kind of bring those different spaces together. But the big thing in my mind is why don't we have a Nigel Dunnett, a Nigel Dunnett, in Hastings? Why don't we have somebody working in that way to really look at the whole town and to, you must have been there a while, Nigel, doing that work in Sheffield. We need the same thing in, in Hastings. So, Maya, when are we going to get one? <laughs> Don't find them very often, those sort of things. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that that's a really nice segue. Maya, I'm gonna put you on the spot as well. Just any comments, observations, thoughts? Um, well, thank you for today. Um, I I've actually been feeling very depressed today. So coming to this webinar has really lifted my moods. I was really angry at the government announcement today to invest 16.5 billion into military spending when yesterday they were saying they were going to invest 12 billion into you know green jobs and I was thinking what the hell why why are you pouring money into military spending so I was in a really bad mood today but coming to this webinar has really lifted my mood it's really um, opened my imagination um, and seeing all those flowers by roadsides um, really lifted me. Um, and it's given me a lot to think about. We, we're, we're currently at the council, so I'm a councillor um, for Hastings Borough Council, for, for those unaware. And I'm the lead for Natural Environment and Leisure. Um, so those are actually two portfolios that really marry well together that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about the natural environment and bringing that into the town. I'm passionate about people being active because that is another way that you can brings people together, whether it's a fitness class or people walking in a park together and like food, bringing people together, um, it makes you feel good as well. So it's these like two areas of natural environment and then also 
you know, leisure, exercise, being active, good for your mind, good for your body, they very much overlap. Um, so the, the, I'm, I'm trying to sort of marry them together a bit more um, and support one another in going forward in infrastructure within the town and, and policies and whatnot. Um, I am also the councillor for Hollington, so that's one of the most deprived wards in in the town. And so when we talk about, you know, trying to, um, you know, lift up the most vulnerable within society, it's very close to my heart because that's exactly what we're trying. I'm trying to do in Hollington and bringing people with us. So that's something that I think about um, a lot, and it's the key to everything. Um, bridging the gap between um, rich and poor. Um, is is definitely is the key um, to all of this. So um, yeah, it's given me a lot to think about. Uh, I would love a, a, a Nigel in this town. If we can clone him, that would be great. Um, we've got Fergus, who I think is is our Nigel. Uh, we may not have a, <laughs> as much of him as um, as we'd like, but it's definitely a way forward. Um, so as I say, we are. I'm in the process at the moment of um, visioning the town. Um, and I'm trying to draw together ideas, but the, the vision is how we can make Hastings sort of bringing it, making it more green, more vegetation in town, um, what we can do that way. So I, will, I would love to have conversations with, with people who have ideas. So I'm collecting, collecting sort of, you know, a vision at the moment. So there is, there is hope going forward. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, we are at the council. We're very, I have to say, we are very committed to going carbon neutral, and we are really committed to, you know, um, a more progressive idea of, um, you know, how how the town should look. But it's that boring thing of of funding and money, um, and there isn't enough political will higher up the tree in terms of you know policy and and money coming down. But that's really boring, so I don't want to start talking about that. Um, but yeah, that's that's where we're, we're at at the council, um, and I would definitely I would invite anyone to get in contact with me if you've got ideas about how we can green the town. Can I just say hi, Maya? Well, nice to hear you. Um, can I just say something? Can people hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, look, uh, I'm not a Nigel, and I'm not a Richard Scott. I haven't got that skill set and expertise. I'm, I'm a you know, a, a good garden, but I don't think there's anything wrong with bringing people from outside. We've got we've got amazing people like Nicole and Julia and Shelley, Shelley who are part of this project. And then we can. The great thing is that people like like Nigel and Richard and probably can can be a part of a team that sort of inspires perhaps and trains up people from Hastings to take it on. You know, so you don't find those sort of experts everywhere. And the great thing about this is that we've pulled on that sort of that wealth of knowledge that we know that's part of our community to be a part of this if this project. And then we can be together, you know, act together in, in, in this. So I, I think um, yeah, Nigel is Nigel and Richard is Richard because there are just only a few of those in the of, of them in that in the world. So you know, it's, it's, it's great to have them on board. And I think the exciting thing as well is connecting people. You know, it's in the, it's, it's the seeing is believing. It's, it's almost, you know, it's, there's a danger sometimes people think um, we've got special gifts in, in a way that we haven't. It's about passing on, um, you know, what we've learned. But it, there's a danger that people think it's only ourselves that can do these things. And it's yeah. wonderful to connect places by the activities and you know the, the pleasure the greatest pleasure we have is when you know one community goes to another place and is excited by meeting and those other people being the the translators for passing on that knowledge too so um, Nigel spoke of beauty too and you know the 25-year plan for DEFRA I think mentioned beauty for the first time in a, in a government sort of strategic environmental document and it's a it's a really rough time for you know councils and budgets, um, but you know in Liverpool this year we should, we were really proud that they kind of bucked the trend and were very creative in in the way they patched money together to enable us to do projects through the through the virus and uh, and great great play to Nigel in in taking these arguments about costings and and showing it's cheaper because people very often wouldn't 
you know, wouldn't believe it. Uh, it's just, you know, they, again, they think we've done some special trick, but it, it, it is cheaper. And it's, but if, if people often don't know how much they've spent um, in their landscapes, in, in the past, that was certainly true of, of many local authorities. They couldn't actually um, describe or, or were able to, to say how much money they've spent. So it's wonderful to, to present these as, as cases and, and link places together by these wonderful projects. But I have to say, when I think of Hastings, I always think about the Grey Owl and the great adventure that happened with, you know, Archie Delaney and um, and that story. And it was apparently, you know, Grey Owl um, on those tours that made David Attenborough a conservationist and made his brother make, you know, make a film about it. So, um, you know, it's wonderful to be associated with Hastings in any way. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, I'm, I've just put a message in the chat box. I'm aware that we're into overtime now and, and people may want to or need to leave, but we are more than happy to keep the conversation going and we'll keep the room open until nine o'clock for anyone who wants to continue speaking. Um, and I certainly wanted to um, just mention a couple of things. Um, one is that we will, have uh, another common room conversation in two weeks time. We are going to focus um, for those who've been part of the series on the three horizons framework um, for thinking uh, about um, creating a more positive vision for the future. Um, if you haven't been part of the conversation, you're more than welcome to join that session in a couple of weeks time. We will send out um, a little bit of background viewing and reading because um, it is going to be um, a participative activity-based session. So we will be using the Three Horizon Framework. So it's, it's gonna be a bit pointless if you come along thinking that you can kind of listen um, and pick up. It will be an active session. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to mention really quickly um, is that, um, there will be a, a conversation tomorrow also at Hastings Community Network. For those who don't know, um, it's uh, I think from 1.30. Debbie, you might need to help me out on this. And it is around climate change. Um, there are quite specific theme areas for this session, but again, it's open to people who are involved in community groups who are interested in having more of a uh, a say in how the town really starts to take uh, take the idea of changing the way we do things much, much more seriously. Debbie, have you got the details? One's on public health, Sherry, so that this would fit really well into that, this whole it's public health, transport and energy and fuel poverty are the three, the three themes. And you join one of those themes. Thank you, Julia. Um, and, and you can just sign up by going on the HVA website, I think, isn't it? I'll find them. I'll find the link. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm aware that there are a few people that have been um, messaging in the chat room. I, I have a hell of a time keeping up with this stuff. I'm too old to manage two things at once. But um, I did, I'm going to put somebody else on the spot. Linda, um, Linda Jill, because you have a wealth of experience um, in a lot of this area. And I just wondered whether you wanted to just um, come off mute. <laughs> and um, yeah, just. Tell us a little bit about um, what you're involved with, particularly in town, because you have done amazing things. Um, um, I don't know that I've done lots of amazing things, but I do know that um, when we were talking about an expert, we do along our road have Judy Clark, who knows an awful lot about um, environmental issues. And she and, and uh, myself and a couple of other people I've been trying to get more things going along our road. Um, last summer, we had somebody coming along spraying the road very dangerously and we kicked up a real fuss with East Sussex County Council with lots of emails going backwards and forwards. Um, I don't think they've been along our road spraying again, as far as I can see, although they did do the West Hill. But um, Judy, somebody called Pauline, uh, Pauline and I, 
started um, we're looking round. We're in Collier Road, which is right on the top near the castle and the West Hill. And we started going down to the wooded area just below Torfield School. And we were looking up, they'd taken various trees down and we were hoping to look and see whether we could get together some, some plan for maybe planting, improving the planting around there. Um, we didn't get very far because of lockdown and ill health, etc. cetera. Um, but we, we have talked to people on the road and a group of us have gone along and we've cleared some of the weeds. And we're now talking about perhaps in the tree pits along the road, trying to put uh, so wild, wild flowers um, or poppy seeds or something of that nature. Um, and I do know that quite a few people on the road do make sure that the badgers and the foxes can go between the gardens. So there is quite um, quite a, a feeling with lots of people up there that we would like to improve the, improve the area. We have in the past also um, got people for picnics on the West Hill area, um, on the West Hill, um, neighbours sitting together just bringing their own picnic we went and cleared the rubbish beforehand we put notices up and say you know please keep this area clear because we're going to have a community picnic um, and that worked that worked well it was very nice for people quite um a way around the area just to get together and talk and there were thoughts there oh maybe we could do more of this maybe we could you know we could get involved in more projects so although nothing um, has picked off just, you know, kicked off just at the moment. I think by doing things like that, you did start to build bridges. And I think having built some bridges, uh, I think that's the way you get the community pulling together and being interested and sharing ideas and, and showing some sort of commitment. Now, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, People would say probably the area up there is is, is affluent. Um, there are lots of educated people, etc. But I don't. I think that there's as much to be gained from getting something going somewhere with people who are prepared to be committed, because invariably when you start, you sow a seed somewhere. I think we know that any success there can then spread. And, um, and any expertise gained can then be uh, disseminated elsewhere. Thanks, Linda. That's, that's really helpful. It's really interesting also in, in the light of, um, some of us had a conversation with Polly and Richard on the weekend, um, which was really, really energizing and inspiring and exciting. And I wanted to just ask whether there's, um, I get, and I guess it's sort of to to Polly and Richard, to Nigel. We have got, you know, um, the aspirational plan for um, the town um, and the station to Zfront and those kinds of things. But also, whether there's one, if there's one small thing that you think that we could start to do. Um, you know, following as we, you know, as we leave this meeting, um, what, you know, what would be the one small thing that you would say has, has made the biggest difference or could make the biggest difference? And I'm going to start, I'm going to actually go round one by one. Fergus, can I throw it out to you? One small thing. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. well many things i don't know i found the right person be positive you know educate yourself and your neighbor and community i, I think i think um you know there's sort of so much negativity flying around you know in the world these days that we can you know i think for me the thing that's excited me because it's not my field at, at all but it is in a you know in a way is that that I, I can see this being absolutely possible to do you know um whether you get government funding or whether you try and get it privately or publicly but we can you know by just having this sort of um concerted effort we can do do something so i think 
be positive is the is the is the thing that I would um, suggest people to be. Uh, thank you, thank you, um, Paul. Can I put you on the spot for this one small thing? I think get out and talk to as many people as possible, especially come back to my point about inclusivity, people who you wouldn't normally talk to about the environment. I firmly believe that everybody has an access point for understanding the importance of what's happening in the world. It could be through the love of pets, through love of gardening, a love of nature, an emotional thing, everybody has a way in which you can engage them with these really important issues. And it's often not the one we expect or the one that would apply to us. So being a lot more flexible and opening and listening to people and building those relationships. And as Fergus said, always be positive, however hard. <laughs> Thank, thanks so much. Um, and Polly and Richard, can I, can I bring you into this? Can I ask? Uh, I'll say. I would say as a very simple thing, make people smile. Um, and that leads to so many other things. And it's the way you approach people in making people smile, of course. But um, if you can then approach people, um, you know, eye to eye, face to face, in, in, in the way that you deliver the project, it makes a huge difference. And that becomes an exciting journey in itself, I think. I mean, we went for big visible spaces, which lots of people would either go in the car past or, or drive past as demonstration sites. But I think twinning like alleys and, and like dead ends with more visible spaces and getting people to move across the town somehow um, Curiosity. Is, Curiosity. is great. And be very happy to share our, this kind of charter of stuff that we've got about raising that curiosity and, and getting those conversations going. But I don't think it has to be the big demonstration visible spaces, but it certainly helps as a talking point. And we didn't put Brandon anywhere. We like it when people just are like, where'd this come from? Like, it's and it's all a bit like that. Fantastic, that, that will resonate with some of us who were in a conversation about whether we should put signs on our community garden, the Transition Town community garden or not. So th thanks so much, you guys. Um, and Nigel, last but not least. Yeah, I think I would just come back to some, I would go back to something Paul said, which is about changing the story. And I think that's really how a lot of, you know, the stuff that you've seen um, that I've been able to achieve, and it's not me, you know, this is all in collaboration. It's all in huge partnerships. Um, but I think it's changing the story. You know, I, I'm as much as anybody here wants to achieve wonderful environmental objectives and so on. Um, that that's kind of happens, but it's not the main message. It's like Richard said, it's about joy, it's about beauty, it's about engaging people, exciting people. Um, it, it's kind of a people first approach to achieving environmental objectives, even though maybe the environmental objectives are what you really want to achieve. Um, I would also say I started really, really small, really small. Um, and it was by asking, it was by approaching Sheffield Council, Parks Department, uh, building a coalition. Can I have a bit of space? You know, we can provide some seed. There's somebody here who can kind of create a bit of space. We've got people who can volunteer to look after it. And they said, yep, yeah, you know, you can have this space in this park, let's give it a go. And as soon as, it's a bit like Graham said, I think, you, you need to look for wins, easy wins, as well as, as really trying to achieve um, other objectives, you know, you get something done that allows you to do more. And my final thing was everybody, and I've learned this myself now, just needs to be an advocate for change mm. all the time. Even if it's just in your own front yard, on your doorstep, with your neighbor, you know, just every opportunity to be an advocate for positive change. Thank you so much. My goodness, I'm so glad we're recording this. There is such amazing, amazing stuff in this session tonight. And I, I, I kind of think it should be mandatory viewing for every single local authority member, every single public sector member every uh, of the population and every single resident here. It's just been a fantastic evening. And I'm so grateful to our speakers who have really come to the table with very little 
um, knowledge about what it is that we're trying to do through this crazy emerging futures thing. So I, I really appreciate um, your generosity and also your willingness to, to just show up and be so unbelievably inspiring. All of you have been fantastic. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We are going to wrap this up, but I am going to do something quite prescriptive. We've got a few people in the room who haven't spoken. I'm going to run through my screen and just everybody, as I say your name, I want one thing that you're going to take away from today. Just one thing. And I'm going to start with Quiva. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. <laughs> Lots of things. Um, just I, one. Okay, well. I'm going to watch the recording back right down. I'm sorry, I can't choose one. I want to research things. Thank you for all the links, everyone. I'm really excited. Thank you. And Suzanne is the next on my screen. Um, just makes me realize, even though I'm moving into a new place and it's got a tiny garden at the front, I'm going to put as many plants in there as possible. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. Throw more plants to give away to people. Yeah. <laughs> Nigel. Sorry, I thought I'd done my bit. I was you have done your bit, but we, we, we want you to say, I'm gonna to come to Hastings as, as soon as possible. I mean, for me, I, it's always looking for the unexpected. I think the biggest impact comes by doing some of these things in unexpected places and not necessarily the places you'd expect to see it happen in. Thank you. And Fergus? I think I'm going to smile more, Sherry. <laughs> Brilliant. Jess? Uh, the river of flowers saved money. That's going to stick with me. That's a very powerful phrase. <laughs> Thank you. And Sue? You're on mute, Sue. There we go. Um, I'm just so inspired that there's stuff we can do with the greenhouse that just feeds into all of this. It's, it's. Uh, I've only been in Hastings for just over a year, and what a place! It's a brilliant place. Fantastic, <laughs> lovely, and Chantal. Uh, I'm going to keep stealing poppy seeds when I'm out in the old town <laughs> and keep planting them in my garden because I, like the other people in the room, absolutely devastated they killed off all the poppies in the old town by the Bourne car park, but I have got some in my garden and I'm going to try and keep connecting people and keep spreading the story really, but in this room and everything I do in my job when I can. Thanks, Chantal. That's great. And Maya? Um, I think stay positive, um, spread enthusiasm, and embrace change. We'll allow you to have those three. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. And I've got Virginia next on my screen. What's your takeaway from tonight? Um, quite a lot of real interest, but really I want to feel that we can pull um, West St. Leonard's into this because there's very much the outskirts. And I feel we shouldn't be. Yeah, great point. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Virginia. That's really, really important. Alex. Study more the application of micro business as practiced by the Grameen Bank in India to setting up small female gardening corporations. Thank you. That's a very inspiring example. And next to Alex, I've got Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Uh, hi. 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 Um, yes, stealing and sharing seeds, smiling more. And um, and going towards Bloomsday, which I think fits in with the whole idea of um, what we're trying to do with growing more um, and developing the idea of Joyce and literature, which is uh, something I've built 
a bit of a community around um, from this town. So um, it's another way to change the story and look at the story. And on changing the story, I thought I need to go away and write it. <laughs> so I like that idea. So I've got headphones on. I feel very strange in these. So yeah, and thank you so much. It was really, really, really inspiring. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. That's great. And um, Amanda, we we should have said uh, Amanda is is Fergus's wife. Sorry, just hello everyone. Um, that was just really, really exciting, uh, really inspirational. It's great to see so many people and those fantastic, all those fantastic ideas and the opportunities for people to learn from other people and then put something into practice, which, which you know, as, as Nigel said, you know, it's, it's possible, it's been done somewhere else. So, you know, we know it can be achieved. So it's just really kind of getting the will to do it in Hastings. It would be amazing. We walked around the station area and the town centre the other day with the kids and Ferguson just looked at it. And, it, and there's so many opportunities there that it's so, and it is so abandoned and unloved. Um, but um, but there could be a real charm and a real opportunity to do things there. So so I think it's great, and I'm going to go and talk about it more to people. I think and try and change that story. Really, fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight as well. And Terry. Well, thank you, Sherry. Uh, I, mean, I, I found uh, it's been very inspiring, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna remember that, and not just uh, sort of let that drift into the next thing, and uh, uh, carry on being an advocate for this stuff in the SCC if it needs to be flagged under every local authority person's noses. Then I'll do my best to 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 try and share and spread that inspiration. Brilliant. Thanks, Terry. Uh, and coming down to the bottom, um, I've got Paul next. Well, I think for me, um, I definitely want to come to Hastings and uh, see what you're all doing, but it's made me even more keen to work in my, my own community, seeing the great job you're doing. We've gone from zero to 70 volunteers in a small town of 8,000, well, village of 8,000 people in the last year. And I come back to the original mantra of the Green Movement, which is to think global and act local. And tonight's a wonderful example. Thank you so much, Paul. And I've got Graham next. I'm going to open my emails so that I don't miss the start of this <laughs> very important meeting. It, it, you, you, you came in late, Graham, and you messaged, and, and it is recorded, so you will be able to pick up what you did. Many thanks. It was Great to very, have you. Very uh, inspiring. Brilliant. And I've got Linda. Build on what connections there are at the moment and look for the opportunity to work in with others to plan and to develop all those little spaces in Hastings that could do with cheering up. Fantastic, thank you. And Sarah, hi Sarah, nice to see you. Oh, got you on me. Sorry, my washer machine's on, so I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, I, kind of, I, I came up with the idea of uh, each time I wanna buy something that I don't particularly need, um, buying some flowers or plant or something to give to somebody instead um because yeah there's just so much excess um it's just ridiculous and yeah climate change so um but i'm already doing quite a lot of stuff in my local area and starting small like starting a community garden and there's other stuff going on on the main road as well that like they're beautifying it and i'm, I'm helping them so <laughs> You've absolutely transformed that area. It's been incredible what you guys are doing. So yeah, I'll keep up with, up with some people on Mount Pleasant Road. It's quite a main, like busy main road, so we're we're kind of spreading out more. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. If anybody uh, hasn't seen it, it's well worth the trip to go uh, and have a look at what Sarah's. Been I'm doing. actually I, I have to move to Marina in the next month, so I've finally got my neighbours to take over. Um, it was kind of mostly me sorting it out, um, 
so now yeah that it's like you know they say when you do community projects you need to be able to just extract yourself and let it um take over you know like find its own life and so it feels like it's doing that now we'll, we'll look forward to having you at the saint leonard's warrior square garden <laughs> <laughs> thanks and jay great to have uh, you yeah I'm, I'm trying to rack my brains on how we can develop uh, what we've already done, uh, well, started uh, down in our little alleyway um, and how we could develop that and perhaps use that to promote a much bigger program across the uh, across the town centre, especially. Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of sat here getting lost in my own mind at the moment. So <laughs> We will see amazing things. I know. Thank you. And uh, the last few down at the bottom, James, hi. Um, I, I picked up from Paul's thing uh, um, when he was talking about positive visions and new stories about how they create dialogue and they rely on dialogue to happen. So I'm gonna have a bit of a resolution to go and talk to at least five people in the next week who have no idea that this conversation happened, who as far as I know, have got busier things going on in their lives. And, but I'm sure that these things are in their minds as well. Um, but I also like Sarah's idea of uh, maybe initiating that conversation with a gift, really, in terms of, um, yeah, just kind of, yeah. So that's our resolution for the week. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Random acts of kindness and conversation. Love it. Brilliant. OK, and the last few. Anna, lovely to see you. Hi. Uh, yeah, I was totally inspired by everyone. I think my thing would be starting small and not being intimidated. Um, I think what um, uh, Fergus was saying about, you know, it's not so different because I've been to Great Dixter and just been like, whoa, that's amazing. But like the idea that you could sort of create that and I'm just already thinking, yeah, I need to, I need to talk to all of my neighbors and think about the space that's behind our row of houses and what we could better do with it. So that's my thing. Fantastic, thank you. And Shelley? Um, I would just say, um, to kind of reinforce it to kind of general kind of activist point that um, is to define yourself by what you believe in, not what you're against. If you want to kind of um, bring people with you and yeah, bring people into your journey and kind of uh, yeah, get them to um, see what you see about things. So, a bit of relentless positivity. <laughs> Which you're fantastic at already, Shelley. So keep it up. <laughs> yeah. And last but not least, we're going to give the uh, final word to Polly and Richard, if that's okay. Very quickly, I just think think back to the wonderful lessons of um, the great Dixter audit. Um, nature is about opportunity. Wonderful things will happen. Um, be bold. Another great Dixter. Christopher Lloyd quote, and enjoy the ride. It's going to be a good one. Um, yeah, and I just think opening up more common rooms in the commons outside in public spaces once we're able um, to do it, not online, but it's been inspirational to be part of this open room. And I think there's a lot of um, learning that I've taken just from the way that it's been framed. So thanks all. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I, I know we're all so looking forward to having some kind of common root conversations outside. We've had one small one the day before lockdown, this second lockdown. So let's, let's all hope that this happens sooner rather than later. Thank you all again so much for this evening. It's been absolutely brilliant. It's been wonderful. It's been generous. It's been shared. It's been exactly what all of us need so much more of. Um, and just a very quick thank you, particularly to Suzanne and Quiva, who have been amazing in keeping this session going because we have completely changed what we were going to do and it was very very fleet and very swift and there was all kinds of stuff going on behind the scenes so they are incredible in terms of how they manage the process tonight so thank you and thank you all for being here we will be in touch and do stay in touch with us we're looking forward to talking to all of you before long
Bye for now.